Hello and welcome back. This video will take a look at the Islamic jizya. What's a bloody jizya? I hear you say. No, it's not a reference to what young Aisha was scrubbing off her old husband's clothes. I'll try to answer the following questions in this video. What is the jizya and where does Islam command it? Did Muhammad implement the jizya and is it meant for this day and age? What are the types of jizya? Who pays the jizya? How much is the jizya? And finally, what happens if someone doesn't pay the jizya? Now I'll start answering all these questions in a minute, but let me point out that I have done another video at the same time as this in a slightly different format. In that one, I take a look at the concept of jizya in the TV show The Walking Dead. The video takes a look at Negan, one of the biggest villains in TV fiction right now, and comparing his actions to those of Muhammad. Their similarities go well beyond jizya. That video has a lot of violence and spoilers for the TV show. It's on my new second channel, TMA, and other platforms if you wish to watch it. Links to that video are in the description box, and you'll also find the links on the end screen. This video, however, will aim to be somewhat of a crash course on the topic of jizya. Yeah, no, there's no affiliation between us. So, let's get going. We hear apologists claim numerous things in relation to jizya. They'll make claims like, it's like there's a cat. As usual, I won't make any claims without backing them up from Muslim sources, which you'll find links to in the description box. So question one, what is the jizya and where does Islam command it? In short, it's extortion masquerading as a tax that is mandated on dhimmi subjects of the Islamic State. Say what? All right, all right, I'll simplify. What the hell is a dhimmi, I hear you say? Many people pronounce it dhimmi, and it basically comes from the Arabic word dhimma, which roughly translates to pact. A more modern meaning would probably be responsibility, meaning that they all fall under the responsibility of the Muslims due to the pact of jizya. The word jizya originates from the Arabic word jaza, which roughly translates to compensation. We can understand what is meant by it in the way that it is defined in volume 15, page 149 in the Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence. Now, unfortunately, this source only appears in Arabic, but I'll translate. It says here, Jizya is what is taken from the dhimmis. It is an amount that is contracted for the people of the book. It is derived from the word jaza, as it is considered compensation paid so he isn't killed. The most common form of jizya is a monetary tax that is levied on monotheistic, non-Muslim subjects in an Islamic state, mainly Jews and Christians. The command to take jizya from these people appears in chapter 9 of the Quran. Verse 29 of this chapter reads as follows. Fight those who do not believe in Allah nor in the latter day, nor do they prohibit what Allah and his messenger have prohibited, nor follow the religion of truth out of those who have been given the book, until they pay the tax in acknowledgement of superiority and they are in a state of subjugation. Now the verse is quite clear in its command. It tells Muslims to fight those who don't believe in Allah or Judgment Day, or even if they do believe these things, you still have to fight them if they don't prohibit what Allah and Muhammad have prohibited. And Islam prohibits a very long list of things. Relationships before marriage, to alcohol, to eating during Ramadan's daylight hours, etc. The verse then says you must keep fighting those who are from the other Abrahamic faiths, who it refers to as the people of the book, until they are forced to pay a tax to recognize Islam's superiority and live in a state of subjection and humiliation. But don't take my word for it here. Let's read what the major classical commentaries by Muslim scholars say. Here we have Ibn Kathir's exegesis of the verse. And like always, all these sources are from Muslim websites and all links to these pages are in the description box so you don't have to trust a single word I say. You can simply go check everything yourself. So what does he say? Paying jizya is a sign of kufr and disgrace. Kufr means disbelief. Allah said, Until they pay the jizya, if they do not choose to embrace Islam, with willing submission, in defeat and subservience, and feel themselves subdued, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of the dhimma, and that's a term to describe those non-Muslims paying jizya in the Islamic State, or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Sahih Muslim recorded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, Do not initiate the salam greeting to the Jews and Christians, 
and if you meet any of them in a road, force them to its narrowest alley. So the whole purpose of the jizya is to disgrace, humiliate and belittle non-Muslims. These three words are key. They come hand in hand with the money that is offered with jizya. Another very well respected commentary on the Quran by Imam Tabari says the purpose of the jizya is this. It means they are giving money to the Muslims to save themselves from being beheaded. How nice. He goes on to interpret what is meant by the last words of the verse, وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ often translated as subjected, humiliated and belittled. And I personally think belittled probably fits best. Anyway, it goes on to say what the Quran means by this term. It means defeated and humiliated. By humiliated, it describes them as despicable. Who else do we have? We have the interpretation of a razi another major exegete of the Quran. What is meant by belittled is that the jizya is taken from them in a state of belittlement, humiliation and shame. The person must come to offer the jizya in person on foot, not riding an animal. He hands it to a person who is seated while he is standing. His beard is then grabbed and he is told to hand over the jizya, and once he pays it, he is pushed away by the scruff of the neck. This is what is meant by belittlement. Now the jizya is not only in the Quran. It's also in the hadiths that are classified authentic by the vast majority of Muslims. When the Messenger of Allah appointed anyone as leader of an army or detachment, he would especially exhort him to fear Allah and to be good to the Muslims who are with him. And here he would list off the commandments of war. And then at the end, he says this, If they refuse to accept Islam, demand from them the jizya. If they agree to pay, accept it from them and hold off your hands. If they refuse to pay the tax, seek Allah's help and fight them. Now moving on to our second question. Did Muhammad implement the jizya and was it meant for his time only? Or is it meant to be applicable in this day and age? Muhammad implemented a precursor to the jizya a year or two before it was officially mentioned in the Quran. If we read the seerah, which is the Islamic biography of Muhammad, we open it up to page 515. This part here talks about how Muhammad captured a man and tortured him before having his head chopped off. But that's not the topic of this video, so I'll move on to the next part. The Apostle besieged the people of Khaybar in their two forts, al watih and as sulalim Until when they could hold out no longer, they asked him to let them go and spare their lives, and he did so. Now, the Apostle had taken possession of all their property, as shaq Nadat, and al kitiba and all their forts, except what appertained to these two. When the people of Fadak heard of what had happened, they sent to the Apostle, asking him to let them go and spare their lives, and they would leave him their property, and he did so. The one who acted as intermediary was Muhayyasa bin Mas'ud, brother of Bani Haritha. When the people of Khaybar surrendered on these conditions, they asked the apostle to employ them on the property, with half share in the produce, saying, We know more about it than you, and better farmers. The apostle agreed to this arrangement on the condition that, If we wish to expel you, we will expel you. He made a similar arrangement with the men of Fedak. Now, a common Muslim apologist tactic, when shown things like this, is to deny the credibility of the source. In mainstream Islam, the Quran is the most authentic source, followed closely by authentic hadiths, and then followed by the biography of Muhammad, which is also based on hadiths. This is despite the fact that the biography was compiled way before the hadiths were compiled and classified. But I don't want to linger too much on whether or not the level of credibility they give the hadiths is over the top in this video. I just want to point out quickly that Muhammad taking half of Khaybar's produce is also confirmed in the most authentic hadith collections of Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. This authentic hadith confirms this deal with Khaybar took place. Narrated Ibn Umar. Umar expelled the Jews and the Christians from Hijaz. When Allah's Messenger had conquered Khaybar, he wanted to expel the Jews from it as its land became the property of Allah, his Apostle and the Muslims. Allah's Messenger intended to expel the Jews, but they requested him to let them stay there on the condition that they would do the labor and get half of the fruits. Allah's Messenger told them, we will let you stay on thus condition, as long as we wish. So they, i.e. the Jews, kept on living there until Umar forced them to go towards Tayma and Ariha. And in case any silly apologist wants to claim that the people of Khaybar gave their property to Muhammad as a present because somehow they loved him, this narration by Enes shows Khaybar was taken by force when the people of the town were completely caught off guard, kind of like a gigantic sucker punch. The Prophet of Allah rode through the streets of Khaybar, and I rode so close to him that my knee touched the thigh of the Prophet of Allah. The rapper got aside from his thigh and I could see its whiteness. That's a bit bizarre. When he entered the town he said, God is great, Khaybar shall face destruction. When we descend in the city square of a people, it is a bad day for them who have been warned and have not taken heed. He said these words thrice, 
The people of the town had just come out from their houses to go about their jobs. They said in surprise, Muhammad has come. We captured Khaybar by force. The jizya was taken by Muslims under Muhammad at plenty of places where Muslims forced non-Muslims to pay up. We read the following in the 15th volume of the Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence, page 154. The Messenger of Allah did not take the jizya from any one of the infidels before the verse of jizya was revealed. When it was revealed, he took it from the Christians of Najran, Zoroastrians of Hajar, and that's referring to an area from modern-day Oman to Basra. Then he took it from the people of Ayla, and that's somewhere northwest of modern Saudi. Adruh, that's near Syria. Adriat, that's near modern-day Amman in Jordan. And other places from Christian tribes who were living on the outskirts of the Arabian Peninsula. Some apologists may like to argue that the jizya was temporary and was not meant to be an operation in this day and age, and therefore ISIS re-establishing the jizya is completely wrong. But the problem with that claim is that it gets debunked immediately with just one authentic hadith that tells us jizya is set to be abolished by Jesus in his second coming. Allah's Messenger said, The hour will not be established until the Son of Mary, i.e. Jesus, descends amongst you as a just ruler. He will break the cross, kill the pigs, and abolish the jizya tax. Money will be in abundance so that nobody will accept it as charitable gifts. Now, before moving on to more detail on jizya, I need to explain a couple of things. There are basically four main schools of jurisprudence which determine Sharia law for Sunni Muslims. Shia Muslims belong to other schools of jurisprudence, but they don't differ that substantially, so I'll just focus on the Sunni ones in this video. I've mentioned them before at length in other videos, but I'll briefly mention them again. This is a map of where followers of these particular schools of jurisprudence live. They are broken down into the Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanafi and Hanbali schools of jurisprudence. So with that in mind, what are the types of jizya? The most common form of jizya is called jizya sulhiyya, which roughly means conciliatory jizya, and is a form that's recognized by all Muslim schools of jurisprudence. However, the Malikis and Hanafis also recognize a second type of jizya, called jizya anawiyya, which means forced jizya. It's a little misleading that they call it that since all jizya by its nature is forced. The difference between the two is very subtle. The standard jizya is a result of Muslims conquering non-Muslims and telling them to either become Muslim, pay a jizya, or the Muslim army will fight them. The forced jizya is imposed on the non-Muslims who initially refused to pay a jizya and were attacked by the Muslims. On most occasions, such people would either be killed, enslaved, or ransomed, as they would be regarded as prisoners of war. But as I said, some scholars see forced jizya as an extra option after fighting non-Muslims. The forced jizya is imposed on the non-Muslims who initially refused to pay a jizya and were attacked by the Muslims. Moving on now, who pays the jizya? In the most common form of jizya, the jizya sulhiya, you can get any non-Muslim from the Abrahamic religions to pay, including women and children, as long as that was part of the agreement set in place. Historically, it was placed upon men most of the time. In this type of jizya, you can also force people to pay their jizya individually or agree that a tribe or community pays off the jizya collectively. In the other form of jizya, which is forced upon a conquered people after battle, only free, sane men and pubescent teenage boys must pay. Women, children, those with blindness or terminal illnesses are exempt. It must also be enforced on individuals only, not collectively on groups. As for the religious groups jizya is accepted from, all four schools are in agreement that it can be offered to Jews and Christians, whether they were Arabs or not, as these two groups are considered people of the book, as the Quranic verse states. All four schools, generally speaking, also say taking jizya from Zoroastrians, whether they are Arabs or not, was fine, because of hadiths that showed Muhammad had taken the jizya from them. Next, we have a religious group that is fairly small in the Middle East, and I know for sure that we have some of them in Iraq to this day. They are called the Mandiists. In Arabic, they're referred to as Sabia. The Hanafis, Hanbalis, and Malikis say this group can be spared death with the jizya, but the Shafi'i say they can only be offered jizya if Christians or Jews claim them to be part of their own group. As for all other religious groups, including polytheists, the Shafi'is and Hanbalis generally view that they aren't eligible for the jizya and don't really have an option besides converting to Islam or being killed. The Hanafis say jizya can be offered to polytheists too, as long as they are not Arabs. The majority opinion within the Maliki school of thought, however, says that jizya can be taken from anyone, including Arab polytheists. Moving on to our next question, how much is the jizya? Now, contrary to what some apologists may claim, the jizya, in its most common form at least, is completely undefined in value. It has no maximum value whatsoever, and is decided on a case-by-case -case basis by the local ruler 
within the Islamic Caliphate. It's not necessarily limited to money either. We already heard about the Jizya-like deal with Khaybar that Muslims receive half their produce. In volume 15, page 183 of the Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence, we read the following example. The Prophet agreed with the people of Najran to pay with 2,000 garments, half delivered to the Muslims in the month of Safar, and the rest in Rajab. It says further, Umar agreed with Bani Taghlib that they pay double what Muslims pay as zakat. You'll often hear Muslims say the jizya is just the same as paying the zakat, which is 2.5% of their annual income. But it's clear from this alone that Umar forced some to pay double what Muslims paid in zakat. The less common type of jizya does have an upper limit, however. Bear in mind at the time, three dirhams was roughly what a shield cost, as we saw in my video on amputating the hands of thieves. The limit for that particular rare type of jizya was set to 48 dirhams for the upper class, 24 dirhams for the middle class, and 12 dirhams for the lower class individuals. Now this isn't a huge amount, but let's not forget that this is only set in the less common form of jizya. As mentioned, the much more common form which is applied by all Sunni and Shia scholars of jurisprudence has no upper limit. And finally, we're moving on to our final question. What happens if someone doesn't pay the jizya? Well, there are several ways to deal with non-Muslims who don't pay the jizya after agreeing to it to save their lives. We already had jizya being paid in clothing and money, but if these non-Muslims said they had no money to offer, what happened? Well, scholars mostly say you shouldn't try to take more than what they're capable of paying. But if we look at how with one of Muhammad's well-known companions, Amar ibn al-As, the conqueror of Egypt, dealt with such a matter, we'll see how low the whole concept of jizya can get. If we read The Origins of the Islamic State, volume 1, pages 353 to 354, we see the Muslim army had another way of taking payment for jizya from the poor Amazigh population living in Barqa, which is now in northeastern Libya, the Berbers of Luwata. Amar ibn al-As made this a condition on the Berber inhabitants of Luwata at Barqa. Ye have to sell your children and wives in order to pay the poll tax on you. So the Muslims here forced the Amazigh people, who they called Berbers, to sell their own wives and children into slavery to pay for the jizya they couldn't afford. This isn't history written by the infidels. This is a Muslim book documenting their own history. Imagine here if the roles were reversed. Imagine if Donald Trump's America Today told Muslims in the Middle East that they either become Christians, be killed, or pay a jizya in humiliation. Then we see some people too poor to pay the jizya, and Trump orders them to sell their wives and children into slavery to generate the money for jizya. How would the Muslims feel about that? Would they make excuses for Trump saying that he was really kind to them and that jizya is fantastic? And imagine again if we were to take the Razi interpretation of how to implement it. Imagine if Trump orders his soldiers to drag the Muslims by the beard when they're taking the money and then push them away by the scruff of the neck. How would you feel about that? So that's what happened to one group of people who couldn't afford to pay. Let's see what other punishments can occur to those who stop paying jizya. According to all four main schools of Sunni jurisprudence, a person who refuses to pay jizya can be killed or enslaved. The majority of these subsects say you can only punish the man, but the Malikis say you can also enslave the man's wife and children. This is detailed on page 139 of volume 7 of the Islamic Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence, in case anybody wants to look up the source. So, in conclusion we saw that jizya is ordered very clearly in the Qur'an and also mentioned in the Hadith. We saw that Muhammad implemented the jizya against numerous tribes and communities in Arabia during his lifetime. We saw that jizya continued to be imposed on new subjects after Muhammad's death. We saw that jizya is meant to continue until the second coming of the Messiah. We also saw that jizya orders the humiliation and belittlement of its subjects. We saw how some of the major commentaries of the Qur'an interpreted what constitutes this belittlement according to Islam's biggest scholars. We found out that jizya has a common form according to most schools of jurisprudence, but two of the Sunni schools add another type of jizya. We went into detail over who the jizya can be taken from and what beliefs these people must hold to be eligible to have their lives spared in return for jizya. We looked at the fact that there is no upper limit to the jizya whatsoever in its most common form and we found out what the penalties were for not paying the jizya, namely death or enslavement. If you are a Muslim who is watching this video and have managed to get this far, I have a very simple question for you. I won't even argue the injustice of treating people differently based on beliefs. I won't argue how this is akin to mafia extortion schemes. Heck, I won't even argue how it's fundamentally a slap in the face to the whole idea of freedom of religion when you get penalized for believing something else. No, my question is, 
Why would a loving God make humiliation and belittlement an integral part to giving the jizya? Why can't it be done with the people paying the jizya, maintaining their dignity? If you want to argue that this isn't actually what it says in the Arabic word sagirun, which means belittlement, has been misunderstood by all major Muslim scholars, then you should tell us why an all-knowing God, who would know this word would be misunderstood, didn't make it a lot clearer in the verse, so Islam never ever treats any other human beings like garbage. Until next time, ciao ciao.